Today I'm going to be talking to you about a paper that Hardeep Singh and I wrote in the Annals of Internal Medicine that describes a safer reporting framework. This is a socio-technical framework for safety-related electronic health work record research reporting, although I believe that it would work for any EHR-based research reporting uh, project. Today I'll be discussing, I'll start off with a multi describing sort of the multifaceted dynamic socio-technical context that affects the implementation effectiveness and the generalizability of different EHR-based interventions. Following that, I'll describe a particular uh, hypothetical example of an EHR-based intervention that uh, we're going to talk about that was designed to improve communication and follow-up of some critical abnormal test results. These are ones that are abnormal but not so critical that they need to be telephoned to the uh, ordering provider. And then we'll talk about what happened during this intervention, this hypothetical intervention, and describe some of the lessons we learned while we were developing this, doing this project and how that would uh, be described in our safer reporting framework. So let's get on with the show. Just to remind you, electronic health record uh, interventions are, are very complex. They involve multiple um, interacting technical components. You've got your lab system, your pharmacy system, your radiology system, maybe admission discharge transfer all going into a patient database. Um, it doesn't involve just individuals using this system, but also groups like nursing and radiology and respiratory therapy. And these organizations within the organ within the these groups within the organization can be very powerful and can either make or break the project. We're going to have a lot of unintended and sometimes uh, a lot of unintended consequences that we have to overcome and we want to talk about those and so people will understand uh, what they need to do to make sure they don't happen in their organization. There's usually a lot of iterative development and then some sort of what refinement of the project as you're going on and so the question is how do you talk about um, those um, while you're doing your the, while you're doing your evaluation sometimes you're about your iteratively refining your project we'll talk a little bit about the effectiveness and how that's affected by the behaviors of those that are using the system and receiving this intervention and um, this is all very multifaceted, so there's both good things and bad things. There's lots of people involved, there's lots of technology involved, and that's what makes reporting on these interventions and understanding whether an intervention that you're uh, doing can work in your organization. An example, uh, to give you some interventions, examples, I'm going to talk about uh, several different papers. One was written by Mark Overhage in 1996, another by Jane Metzger in 2010, and then one was written by our research group in 2012. And these papers have particularly important meaning to me because together they sort of uh, were the impetus for why we had to write this uh, paper about how to report these. Because all of these projects had something that we really needed to learn from, and the question is how do you report that so that people can learn? Oops. Cuidado que se frenó el audio. Uh, electronic health record based alerting system is used to increase the use of preventive care reminders for hospitalized patients. And so, for example, to tell them to um, you know, get a mammogram while they're in the hospital. You can imagine there's some pluses and minuses. I mean, the patient is right there, it's a good time. Also, the patient's uh, maybe sick and it's maybe busy. And so it's, uh, they started off with these alerts and they put them in to the system and they ran a randomized controlled trial. And when they were done, <clears throat> there was really no difference between the control group and the intervention. And then they um, refined their system learned a lot of their system, and then five years later, they redid the system. They redid the study. And this time, it was interesting, if you read the um, discussion of this paper, they got a New England Journal of Medicine paper out of this, because this time, their, their intervention had a big effect. And the big changes they made were uh, this idea of sort of highlighting suggested reminders, 
um, with a distinctive color scheme. And so you can see in the top screen, it's all gray and black. And so they made it more colorful. They disabled the escape key on the keyboard. If you're familiar with clinicians, a lot of them know to hit the escape key to make the decision support go away. They repeated the reminder several times while the patients were in the hospital. And so um, this helped remind the physicians that this was serious. And then it got the physicians to um, allow them to just hit the enter key to accept that they didn't have to do anything else. It's pretty amazing that in the same hospital, with the same computer system, the same set of reminders, that a few simple changes to sort of the interaction mode of how the system was used accounted for a huge difference and got them from writing a paper in the Archives of Internal Medicine, which is a, is a good but not great journal, to the New England Journal, which is one of the great medical journals in the entire world. That's an example of what, of what you've got to talk about when you do these kind of papers. The second paper was one that was written by Jane Metzger and uh, David Klassen and a few of their colleagues. And it was looking at the leapfrog scores. And this was a test that was developed uh, to check your decision support systems functionality within your hospital. And uh, they've given this test to hundreds of different organizations. And this is the result of sort of about the first 60 or so organizations that they tested. And they analyzed the data across the x-axis. You see the different EHR vendors. And the y-axis talks about the score that they got on this test. The higher the score, the better the clinical decision support system is at detecting these adverse drug events. And this is a simulated test where they give the users some uh, drug orders and some medications to enter on patients that it would, they would be allergic to or they would have a laboratory test result that would indicate that they shouldn't get that medication. And what's interesting is in this study is that if you look across the vendors, the variation between within a vendor within a vendor at different organizations is greater than the difference across vendors, across, across the vendors. And so what this means is that the EHR isn't really the key component. In fact, the, the vendor only accounted for 27% of the variation between these sites. And so what that means is there's other socio-technical factors that are affecting whether this decision support system works other than just the vendor. And I'll just have to say that I hear so many people say, we're going to change from vendor A to vendor B, and that's going to solve all our problems. And this graph sure tells you that that's not going to happen unless you change the way your organization works, the people, the attitudes, the policies and procedures and things like that, you're going to get the same result. And the third paper is one that our research group did, and this was a project where we were um, trying to evaluate the effect of sending uh, Lab pathology reports to providers in their in-basket as mandatory automated notifications. Prior to that, the clinicians had a choice of whether they wanted to receive these results in their in-basket or not. We thought this was just going to be an easy win, that we were going to put this in and we would see a huge um, improvement in the number of uh, abnormal reports that were followed up on. And we did this study and it turned out that there was really no difference between uh, the two groups, and we did this in two different hospitals, and um, you can imagine how disappointed we were in the results because we thought we were going to get a great paper out of this and a really big journal. And then we started doing some sub-analyses, and in our sub-analysis, we found out that one of the sites accounted for nearly all of the reports without follow-up, but it turns out that in the pre prior to the study, that was also the case, is that one hospital was not doing as well on this project as the other one was, even though these were both in the same organization, even though they were different hospitals, uh, physical locations, they were using the same EHR, although it had different implementations at the, at the different organizations. And it was basically the same sort of people and the same sort of organizational structure. What we uh, couldn't do with the research data we had was trying to figure out exactly what was responsible for this, but we think it was more about the way these people were organized and the way the management of the hospital ran that caused this uh, difference in these um, reported events at these different hospitals. So uh, when we started thinking about this, we looked at other guidelines that developed for
Paula. Evaluation studies in health informatics, and that was derived from both the consort and the quorum and the STARD standard. All of these papers are really interesting when you're trying to either learn how to do studies or learn how to report studies, because they sort of tell you these are the kind of things that you need to be uh, reporting. There's also the guideline for good evaluation practice in health informatics, the Squire study, and then the re-aim approach all can help you sort of understand how to frame your discussion and frame your uh, methods and try to help people to understand what happened. The problem is that none of these were really well suited to reporting sort of the dynamic nature of sort of the relationships between the technology and the healthcare systems and the people that work within them um, in, a, in a hospital. And so uh, we developed this uh, safer reporting framework, and I'm going to explain that to you today with uh, a hypothetical example. And in this case, the hypothetical intervention, we picked that so we could have uh, problems in every area of the model, as opposed to if I would have picked the real one, usually we only have problems in two or three of the eight dimensions of our model. And so in this case, so we're talking about an EA intervention that is designed to improve communication and timely follow-up of these subcritical abnormal test results. And uh, it's going to be a lot of the issues that we, we, we've heard about and read about in the, in the literature. And sometimes I think of this as sort of a brisk walk down disappointment lane for my entire career, uh, all of these kinds of things have happened to me, many of them more than once. And I'm going to talk for each of the parts of the model, I'm going to talk about what socio-technical changes were made that we implemented with the EHR, why the intervention did or not did not lead to the safety improvements that we hoped, more often than not, it did not. And then I'm going to talk about how this could be applicable or exported to other organizations. So when you write your paper, or when you read a paper, you want to know, could I have done the same um, study, or could we do the same intervention at our place, and would we expect it to work? And if you report it correctly, people should be able to understand a little better whether they can expect to get the same results. So let's talk about how we would make some of these uh, recommendations and uh, for reporting studies. So the first part of our model, is the hardware and software. And in this case, um, we found when we got there to do this project, the first functionality that was missing was the software that will allow you to track uh, test results follow. -up. So what we did was we created some new functionality that would create a, a computer-based tracking of these test results. And um, so in your paper, you need to describe that new functionality, how it worked, how it's designed, how it's implemented. And then you want to tell like, what happened in this case. In this case, it didn't really work. So our, our tracking software worked great, but we couldn't get it implemented or integrated with our EHR. And so the clinicians were forced to go from the EHR to our tracking software. And as you can imagine, <clears throat> they didn't like to make that transition, so they didn't use the system. And the lesson we learned on this part was you've got to make sure that the EHR vendor is uh, able and willing to integrate any new software that you make into their system because clinicians just do not like uh, having two different systems that they have to go to. And this is one example of the type of uh, information you need to report in this uh, aspect of the model. The next aspect of the model is the hardware, is the clinical content. In this case, we were doing these uh, subcritical <coughs> imaging reports and we, we, we wanted to have um, the computer alert someone that there was a, an abnormal test result. The problem was that there wasn't a structured format to facilitate the radiologist entering information about the nature of the test. And so the computer was not able to pop up alerts because we didn't have a structured code. So the first thing we did was we developed a, a coding uh, system to uh, describe these different kinds of abnormal test results. And that worked great until we got down to the why this happened was so difficult. Um, it turned out that we worked with one radiologist who liked this idea, but the other radiologist refused to enter the codes in the computer system. So we had a system that worked, but no one would use it. And so the lesson we learned here and what you've got to talk about is, do you have buy-in from the organization, the group of people that are actually going to use this system? Too many times we build um, computer tools without asking the people that are going to use them whether they uh, want them first, whether they like, whether they are, and whether they're going to 
use them and whether they think would help. And so, so many times we, we forget about the actual users of our system. Once we learn that, we'll be on to the next one. Next part of our model is the human computer interface. I already told you one uh, case where Mark Overhage and this group uh, changed the interface. And in this case, it turned out the, there was a poor interface design of our uh, electronic health record. It was causing them to miss some of these abnormal test results. And it turned out a lot of it was because the column width of the, of the screen where they were putting this piece of data wasn't wide enough. And so some of the text got truncated and the clinicians couldn't see that it was an abnormal test result. And so they missed following up. And so um, the simple solution that we implemented was we, we, we made it so the columns were a little wider on the screen so they could display all, all of the data. And that seemed like such a great idea until we took this out to the department and showed them. And it turned out that they had these old computer monitors that were not um, big enough to allow this new wider column to display on the screen. So now we had a wider column, but the rest of the screen was required scrolling. And uh, it turns out that clinicians are particularly bad at scrolling, so this didn't work very well. And so one of the things you want to make sure is that if you're redesigning your user interface, you want to make sure that the organization is committed to buying the new hardware and software that's required to run this new user interface. And this has not only happened once. So now we're going to talk about workflow and communication. And this is a case where we didn't have any uh, fail-safe capability to ensure that the clinician had received the test results. And so what we needed to have was a system that would remind someone or notify someone else that this uh, particular clinician didn't do their work. And so in this case, we would create a report, ran every day, that report would come out, and then the idea was that someone would call the physicians or tell the physicians this is something we need to follow up on. It worked great, except we couldn't find a person that we could add this work to their job. So we had a nice report, but no one would do the work. And so you want to make sure that when you design something like this, you have people that are around to do the work. So sometimes we talk about that's the last mile. The computer can do some work and print out the report, but someone usually has to take that report and then go and actually interact with the, the patients in the hospital. The next part of the report is uh, the model is the people. In this case, uh, the clinicians were using a paper-based system to track their results. And, and you can imagine in a <clears throat> computerized hospital, this is not the best way to do. So what we wanted to do is create a, an automated report that can be fed back to the clinician that can tell them to keep track of these workarounds. And the problem with this was the clinicians had a high burnout rate. They were further overwhelmed with more work to do we didn't take work away, we really just added work to the uh, system, so that really didn't help them. And so then the final thing, as we learned, is that you need to have dedicated time for the clinicians to do the work that you're asking them to do, especially when it's... The next part of our model is this inter internal organizational features. And in this case, uh, the organization didn't have a policy for how to hand off work from one set of uh, people and the other. And so in this kid's situation, we had a lot of trainees, trainee doctors, and we would get these uh, results into their in-basket or their computer system, but then they would be transferred to another unit and we didn't have a way to transfer these in-baskets from one physician to another. And so we created a new policy. We worked with the leaders of the hospital and created a new policy to make sure that the people that were responsible for these trainees' test results would be um, held responsible for these results, and then we, they would be able to transfer them to the new person or the, to them themselves. And we tried to solve this uh, problem, the problem of the handoffs. The problem was that the software functionality we had didn't have a way to forward test results from one provider to another, and so we couldn't make that transfer of the data from the computer system to the other person. And so you want to make sure that <clears throat> any solutions you come up with um, have the functionality in the software that's needed to do the work that you're asking them to do. Next part of this model is the external rules and regulations. And in this case, um, there, were, there were really no external rules because the uh, Joint Commission only talks about these critical tests in the world, not the subcritical ones. And so it turns out that there were a lot of care team members um, that weren't really included for um, patient notification and weren't allowed to take 
these notifications and follow up on them. And so we had these, what we call a scope of work where the nurses weren't allowed to actually call the patients and uh, take the appropriate follow up action. And so we had to think about sort of your state or your national rules or regulations about how people work. I want to make sure that the people are allowed to do the work that you're uh, trying to do. And sometimes a computer can take over part of the work, but there's still some work and their licenses that have to be considered. And then the last part of the organization of the model is to try to think about how you measure it and monitor it. In this case, the organization didn't really, <clears throat> excuse me, have a process for measuring the follow-up actions of these subcritical test results to see if their system is working. So we created a dashboard, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that ranked the clinicians on their performance related to the follow-up. It turns out that this was really nice, except the physicians didn't like to see their scores because they didn't realize some people were doing better than them and no physician likes to be worse than someone else. And so they didn't like to be compared. So we ended up using a, an anonymized report feedback system. So the clinicians would know what score they got, they know <coughs> where they were, but nobody else would know that they were the worst on that list. I'd like to uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. Once again, it's been great to be at your 15th annual conference. Thank you so much. Bye. Well, we're back. I hope that everyone was able to listen to the talk. Eh, bueno, se terminó. Espero que se haya podido escuchar la charla. Eh, ahora dejamos el espacio abierto para, para preguntas. Eh, Dean, would you open your mic? So I'm here. This, good, good. This let me know that you were able to follow the the, the talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm good, here. Good. good, good. No, no, because I when I was showing the the video, I was not able to see what was going on behind the screen on the on the Zoom. Oh. But well, now we have a a couple of minutes. To, to have a, a couple of questions. So I see that um, Chris is here, also Eta. So most of you are in Argentina. My question is regarding, you know, the, uh, these COVID times, no? Because all your, what you said about the what, the how, and the, and the, the, the what, the why, and the how, uh, seems to work in a control environment. Let me just translate. Uh, Dean habla mucho de el el qué, el por qué y el cómo, ¿no? Y en el cómo uno se puede llevar cierto tiempo en la vida diaria. Pero ¿qué pasa en este contexto actual de COVID donde rápidamente hay que tomar medidas? So, so when you are, what we, although it was quite chaotic our work, COVID make it, make it worse. How can you work on the how when you're in the middle of the deck, what would you suggest? Well, you know, I think um, if we've learned anything with our computers and um, our intervention, these systems, and too many times we stay in our own little uh, place and say, this is the way the world should work. Here's the way the computer's going to do it. I'm going to solve all your problems. And then the people will say, Hey, that's not really what we really need to um, go out to talk to those people that are delivering the care and seeing what they need and seeing if we can help them. And I think that's always critical, but even more critical now. Do you have some kind? Well, no. uh, do you have some kind of example at the at the university where you work? Um. Well, you know, we've spent a lot of time in our place um, trying to make dashboards that are showing uh, how many beds we have and what the projections are and then trying to get people like in the Texas Medical Center, other, you know, other hospitals that have, you know, a worse problem. So I think all of our clinicians wanted some way to know Uh, when the uh, bad part was going to be over and what they could do, and like that. Eh, eh, Dean dice que 
trabajaron mucho sobre todo lo que son reportes y tableros para poder hacer el seguimiento. Yes, right now we, we needed to know where we were standing. So, if uh, Eta and Chris do not, we, let me just check because I have something here in the chat. Yes, <laughs> so 